Hi, I'm Drew, and I'm an amateur model builder. I'm building a layout in my basement called the White River Line, inspired by the Frisco Railroad in the Ozarks. In this episode, I'm going to continue to work on the lumber yard kit, the kit bash project that I started a few weeks ago. I got quite a bit of the modifications done in the last episode, and I've got a little bit more to do. What I'm hoping to do primarily in this video is get some of the paint going. Now, I also wanted to remind you about the giveaway that I've got going on for some of these Bowser uh, covered hopper kits. So stick around to the end of the video for more details on that. Let's jump on into it. Before I get started on painting, there are a couple things I need to take care of. First, I need to finish up the floor of the millwork shop. If you remember from the last video, this shop sits above the lumber yard and is mostly scratch built. I built the floor using 020 styrene sheet and laid individual boards of 010 by 060 styrene strip. Now I need to make the joists, so I set up my choppet to the correct width. I'm using 2x8 scale styrene strips. Once the joists are cut, I mark every 16 scale inches on the bottom of the floor. As you can probably tell, the floor is pretty bowed. So I used my 1, 2, 3 blocks to keep it flat and to keep the strips square while cementing them in place. Even after installing these joists, the shop floor is still pretty bowed, but I can take care of that during assembly. Next, I revisited the posts and the beams for the lumber sheds. There are two sheds in this piece. One is basically an Atlas lumber yard built from the kit's instructions. The other is two of these kits combined. I would modified these posts and beams to connect them together, but I'm not too happy with the placement of these diagonal supports. In all honesty, I don't think I quite understood the instructions in the article I'm using. Even still, after having looked over it several times, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to have done. Well, regardless, I'm going to fix this and make these pieces symmetrical. I'm going to cut these pieces here, here, and here. Then I can move that inner piece out to the end and make up the difference with some scraps I have left over.
After a bit of messing about, I think I got these right. Not perfect, but good enough. Next, I remove the remaining parts I need and file them. Then, I started making some modifications, starting with the board and batten and siding on the office. Generally speaking, styrene kits have nice, tight, consistent lines. When modeling some materials, that's good, but most things do not have nice, tight, consistent lines. I carved in some gaps in the clapboard siding. I carved away at the post and beams a bit too. I used a file to provide some more definition between the planks on these platforms. I packed up the parts and took them upstairs to give them a wash. Once this was done, I started applying some liquid mask to the areas on the parts that will be glued together. I tried this a little bit when I was working on the coaling tower, but had abandoned it out of impatience. Heavy paint on the glue joints make it not quite as strong, and I generally file or scrape it away. Maybe adding this masking will make this process easier. After spending about an hour and a half applying liquid masking to just one of these lumber sheds, I began to question this process. I highly doubt that I'm saving much time here. Plus, this liquid masking really gunks up my brushes. I had to end up throwing this one away. It's a good thing I don't really like this brush. So, I started priming all my parts. I'm using Israeli Sand Gray Primer. It'll provide a good undercoat for most of the painting I'm doing. For these small parts, I used a bit of old sticky back foam board to keep them from blowing away. With all the parts primed, I'm ready to jump in to painting in earnest. Starting with the easy stuff first, I used a mix of concrete and light gray for the bases. I'm not doing much weathering or other effects here. Most of the base is going to be covered by the building or environmental details on the layout. Next, I started on the exterior of the sheds. I found an old lumber yard in Elbert, Colorado I'll be using for some inspiration. There's some really nice paint chipping. I did a little bit of underpainting first, starting with a mix of light gray, dark gray, and dark earth. I'm just trying to add some streaking. I darkened my mix a little and then added a little bit more streaking. This effect is a little too subtle, so I did a little dry brushing with concrete. That wasn't quite dark enough, so I added some dark gray. Next, I applied a bit of Vallejo chipping medium. After it dried, I added the main color for these pieces. I really like the yellow of the prototype I found, and there's a lumber company back home in the Ozarks that uses yellow as their primary color too, so I decided to go with that. I mixed up some yellow and off-white. It was pretty bright, 
so I added just a single drop of blue to bring that brightness down. I also needed to add way more white than I anticipated. So I switched to plain white and the model air colors, which are designed for airbrushing, rather than the off-white, which I have in just the plain model colors, which aren't designed for airbrushing. Part of the story of this building is that the owner added on to the business over time. I started with the newest portion of the building, the mill workshop. Then I lightened the color a bit and painted the oldest portion, the single lumber shed. They didn't bother to repaint the older portion when they added on, so the older portions of the building are a bit faded and perhaps they weren't able to match the color they had used before. I lightened the paint a couple more times. Once this paint had dried a couple of hours, I came back and did the chipping. I used a bit of water to reactivate the top layer of paint and then used a couple of stiff brushes to scrub it off, as well as a small bamboo skewer. Again, I tried to modify the amount of chipping based on how old the portions of the building are. This chipping technique takes a bit of practice and getting the timing right for when to scrub and how hard to scrub. When you first add the water, there's a small portion of time in which the paint comes off really easily. But if you wait a bit longer, the paint gets a bit tacky and comes off in small pieces. Using the bamboo skewer can help to control a bit when you do want to take off larger portions of paint. Here on the gable ends of the mill workshop, I didn't get the timing quite right, and I took off some bigger pieces than I would have liked. As you continue to scrub, the paint reactivates in such a way that you have a bit of a wash on the surface of the piece. Sometimes, once I'm done with the chipping, I'll dampen my brush and move that wash around to get some variation in the coloring of the chipping. This can help soften the edges of the chips a bit. As you can see here, I've done a bit more chipping on the older parts of the building and less on the newer. I did go a bit heavier on the chipping on the side of the shed where there is a workbench. Workers in this area would rub up against the paint while working and there would be more chipping. I didn't do any chipping on the side walls of the mill workshop. I'm still kind of thinking through that and I'll probably use a stippling technique here. I moved on to the office building. Here I'm going with an aged cedar effect for this board and batten siding. This isn't something I've done before, so I did a little of experimenting with a few different colors and techniques. I also broke out my new wet palette I got for my birthday. When I'm looking to develop a new painting effect, I'll keep a prototype picture close by to try and match the colors and overall look. A lot of the time it is just playing around until I get something I like. When possible, I try to experiment on a piece that isn't going to be seen as easily. But by and large, I have enough confidence in my painting that I don't bother to use a test piece. Once I got down what I wanted to do, I refined my palette and started from scratch. I used the following colors. Burnt red, light rust, German black brown, sky gray, light gray, and yellow. I started with a mix of German black brown, light gray, and sky gray to get a relatively neutral brown. This will be the darkest color I use. I don't load the brush too heavily, but it isn't exactly a dry brushing. I'm looking for something that is a bit rough 
and that has soft feathered edges. I added it a bit more heavily on places where water would sit long and darken the wood more. Next, I mixed each of the burnt red, light rust, and yellow with sky gray. I used this more like a glaze. My goal is to get some highlights and have a bit of transparency on the darker areas. I make it a bit lighter on the areas that didn't get much direct rain, under the eaves for example. Then I went back with some sky gray tinted slightly with some German black brown, as well as some of the original darker German black brown and gray mixture, to add some hints of contrast here and there. I had to take a pause for a day or so on this work, and my new wet palette did its job. The paint remained workable, although the pigments had separated a bit. One of the struggles for me when splitting up work into multiple sessions is trying to stay consistent. More or less, I think it looks good. One last bit of detail on these pieces are some knots. For this, I turned to my favorite brush, a 15 knot. For each knot, I added a sky gray dot, trying to keep it random. Then I went back with German black brown and added the knot. Rather than adding a well-defined daub, like with the sky gray, I tried to keep the edges a little uneven and feathered. I've got a little more painting to do before I can start assembly. You may notice I'm wearing a new White River Line t-shirt from my newly launched store. Check out the link below and pick up a shirt, or a hat, or a coffee mug. It would be a great way to support my channel, along with liking this video and subscribing. Then don't forget about the giveaway of these Bowser 70 ton 2 bay covered hoppers. Just leave a comment below to enter, and once I reach 2,000 subscribers, I'll pick a couple of winners. I'll paint and weather the car for the first place winner, and the second place winner gets a completed kit. You'll have to do the paint and weathering on your own. This project has been a nice break from the track work, which I'll get back to in my next episode. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook, and those links are below, along with a description of the tools, supplies, and resources I use. Thanks again for joining me, and please join me again next time as I continue modeling the White River Line.